um hello uh, good evening everyone Compo composability is to software as compounding interest is to finance it's sort of this magical thing where if you get it going it has this sort of exponential hockey stick this is quoted by chris dixon a very good evening to everyone present here this is akil srinivas a fellow student of, of iit madras bs program and i welcome all of my peers students participants and our beloved guests and professors to this event before looking into what web3 technology is, is itself what is blockchain a blockchain is essentially a digital continuously expanding list of data records such a list is made up of numerous data blocks and, that are arranged chronologically and connected and protected and secured by cryptographic proofs the initial design of a blockchain may be traced back to the early 1990s when the physicist w scott stornetta and the computer scientist stuart haber used a chain of blocks to use cryptographic cryptographic techniques to protect digital documents against data theft the work of dave bayer hal finney and many other computer scientists and cryptography enthusiasts has been certainly influenced by that of haber and stornetta and this ultimately resulted in the development of bitcoin the first ever decentralized electronic payment system or simply the first cryptocurrency and in 2008 the bitcoin white paper was released under the alias of satoshi nakamoto so we must be aware of uh, that name and you must have heard it somewhere around so what is blockchain technology like diving into the concepts of blockchain it's basically a distributed ledger, ledger technology and which means that you have a ledger and it's an immutable record that is stored under multiple sections and you go uh, and it's a immutable record as i mentioned before so no one can tamper uh, with the record that is already stored and this uh, blockchain technology is also based on smart smart contracts you know for speed transactions and it's a basic set of rules and this is what is called as a smart contract so why am i talking about blockchain over here is isn't the headings indicating web 3.0 well what is it so that is why we are here today and we are presenting you web 3.0 fiesta hosted by cosmos iit madras bs and sponsored by iot agi and covalent with that note i would like to introduce our guest speakers for the day mr agrim nagrani and mr amog s gopadi agrim nagrani is a founder public speaker mentor and crypto stocks and forex trader based out of india he is assistant director of youth entrepreneurship and skilling cell in msme and startup forum bharat currently he has founded iot agi an iot tech enabled company that is contributing in the industrial revolution 4.0 by digital transformation and automation of various industrial sectors complete ai iot solutions provided by iot agi enhances security productivity and sustainability he is working passionately in the domain of web 3.0 space as a managing partner of nebula web 3 and uh, to develop innovative solutions based on blockchain cryptos and nfts Mr Amog is a software developer working in the domain of web3 and deep learning his passion lies in the exploring systems to build the future of user interaction also he is particularly interested in building social media platforms at the intersection of augmented reality and blockchain also mr amog does freelancing as part time now diving right into the session today we will be having a workshop and a debate for the ones who are new here debate round 1 was conducted yesterday that was 13th of august and out of which four participants have qualified for the final round and the debate will be held from 7 o'clock so i request all of them to please stay till then to look at the heated argument so why the delay let's dive right into the amazing workshop experience by mr akrim nagrani welcome to you on the dais sir thanks akil thank you so much for such a warm welcome so hi guys my name is akrim nagrani i am based out of ahmedabad so today we are going to have a session on web3 so basically we will be discussing about the web3 space particularly the introduction of web3 how is it going to transform the future and how is it different from the web2 space uh akil i am sharing my screen yeah 
لا از ماي سكرين فيزيبل لكن يو ار اون ميوت اي دونت ثينك سو سر يور سكرين از نوت فيزيبل كان يو بليز شير يور سكرين اجين اه ناو از ات فيزيبل Hello. Hello. I hope my screen is visible. Your screen is visible. Yes. Yes, yes. again. We can yeah. see your screen. Sure. So now we will be starting. Ki how we came to Web three. So initially we had the Web one point zero, then Web two point zero, and now we are entering the stage of Web three point zero. So Web one point zero, basically the Web one was the read only era. Where we had the static pages were there, frames and tables were present, and mostly we were using the HTML was there, ads were there, particularly the static sites were there, which were being used to get the read-only information from the internet. Then came the era of Web 2.0, where we were able to read and write. So this was the particularly era of social media, and which is the era right now we are evolving from Web 2.0 to Web 3.0. So in Web 2.0, we were able to create a particular content as well as post it over social media. As we all were using Facebook, is there Instagram is there? So read as well as write. We were getting extracting the information from the internet as well as uploading a content. Now coming towards the Web 3.0 era. So in Web 3.0, particularly the advantage is to read, write as well as own that particular content. So owning means is that you can directly monetize the content which is available in the Web 3.0 space, or you can say over the internet using Web 3. So it's called a semantic web, and the technology which we are going to use is the blockchain technology. It's also involving the artificial intelligence and creator economies there, decentralization is being used. Then coming the further use cases of NFTs are present, metaverse is there, CBDC is there. So the main advantage of Web 3.0 is that it's providing you the verifiable and trustless thing. That you need not to trust on a particular single entity for your say a transaction you are doing in the bank or maybe for your identity. So it's a trustless process in Web 3 as well as self-governing. So there are other advantages as well of using Web 3 space, ah, uh, which are as follows: that you can say permissionless is there. Uh, distributed and robust Web3 is quite stateful, and native built-in payment options are available in Web3 space, where you can directly do the peer-to-peer -peer transfer, which doesn't involve any middleman. Ah, uh, you can take the example of say this. Coming towards the crypto, so here you can take example of making payments. Ah, uh, what we used to do till now was that. particularly if we want to transfer a uh, amount say from person a to person b so the only option available for now was through a bank uh, if we are we were having bank account then we were going to transfer it through particular bank saying ki banking personnel will do the payment on our behalf and no physical transfer was being made it was just a notional once the bank person confirms ki this amount of money is present in your bank account then the transfer happens so in this case there was a issue of like particularly depending upon the bank person so for making huge payment sometimes there were banks or holidays were there so this delayed the payment a lot which directly affected various sectors and one of the most affected sectors is the supply chain management or the logistics we are particularly you can say each and every moment is essential for the transfer of goods so this issue is being resolved using the blockchain where you can directly transfer the payments or you can make payments from one person to another through a single click uh for this particularly you need to use the cryptocurrencies available in the market so as we all are aware various cryptocurrencies are there uh, bitcoin being used one of the most used cryptocurrency basically used for the peer to peer transactions then ethereum is there solana matic and various other currencies are being used so coming towards the bitcoin ki why are we using particularly bitcoin so bitcoin's most advantageous thing is ki like it can be directly used for the peer to peer transactions and it can be taken place from anywhere present anywhere by any person present in the world you just need the wallet address and your particular wallet should contain that amount of bitcoins 
and the value it holds, you can transfer your money accordingly. So in this way, it had made the life quite much easier for persons to transfer your particular, say, like Amok do the freelancing thing. So he must be having clients from various, you can say foreign clients are there. So the payment takes a time a lot for wire transfer of something. But the cryptocurrency has made it quite easy for like many people for the making transfer of money. Uh, coming next to the decentralized finance. So as we all know, ki like particularly in initial previous eras, you can say the particular finance was in the form of banks and the fiat currencies. Uh, that is was the traditional financial system which was being established by banks and fiat money was involved in it. This was the finance 1.0 era, which was present approx, you can say 40 to 50 years prior from now. So where we were completely dependent on the banks for making the transactions. Every Each and every financial transaction was taking place to the banks. And for that, we were supposed to be physically present there. But gradually what happened was that the advancement of technology had to come over to the finance 2.0 where we were having the access of our mobile bank accounts where their internet net banking was used, payment gateways are being present, UPI, the unified payment interface is being introduced where you can directly make the payments at your convenience. But here also you are again depending upon the bank for making the payment. So there are times when the server goes down and you need to make payment, then there's an issue. Or maybe you can say like there's a, stuck like some of sometimes a payment is stuck in the gateway so then you need to make a call set up follow-up calls are being organized to the customer care to get your payment done at that particular moment so now for that issue to be resolved we are coming to the web 3 era where finance 3.0 is there so it's particularly the open financial system being used where the customer has most of the powers and it minimizes or you can say eliminates the intermediate intermediaries or present in this particular banking system or the financial system. It has also eliminated various fees and charges which were being used as a commission for payment gateways, the penalties which were being imposed maybe due to the delayed payments or insufficient amount of some present in the account. This all has been resolved with the help of Web 3.0. It's particularly a permissionless system that is not bound by any particular say, geographical boundaries. You can make payments from anywhere to any person in the world. So this is the power of Web 3.0, which is being utilized in the financial sector. Now coming particularly to the DAO. So you can you must be knowing ki what a DAO is. DAO is, stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. So this is the auto, uh, you can say per complete entity which is being controlled by the users. And there is no central control or authority present who, uh, who will be handling this particular platform. So how to create a DAO? For that, we need smart contracts. So what smart contracts is? So smart contract is one of the use cases of blockchain that is to be used for executing a certain criteria which are being fulfilled. So it's a particular say, set of contracts written or a code written for particular rules which are being used to make the that particular statement or you can say agreement being executed. So there are various applications of smart contracts. It's mostly used in the supply chain management where there's a lot, lot of data present which needs to be tracked at each and every moment. So there the smart contract are being used at a very large scale to keep a track of data and then there must be a thing that the data is not being tempered so that we are having a record fee at what particular moment, which incident happened and what was the reason. And there are other examples also in the space of trade finance, invoice discounting, loan identification, everywhere the smart contracts are being used. So how these particular smart contracts work? So smart contracts operate on a blockchain by executing various simple code commands are there like if then while loops present in the codes are like a coding student must be aware of these things. So the code is written in various languages such as JavaScript is there, Solidity is there, Viper is there. So these are the languages being used for the blockchain to write the smart contract. So now coming towards the use cases for this, the smart contract can be used maybe say for registration of a vehicle so that you are having a track of that particular vehicle and if it gets lost or stolen then you can easily recover it through that particular smart contract which contains the vehicle number 
this is one of the most active uses which government is also even planning to integrate in the real time another example is for the land authority or you can say land sale uh, in real estate purpose as we all know key while registries are being done for particular land parcels so there is a lot of chances of tampering of that particular registry or document or agreement so here the smart contract plays a key role where once a smart contract is written you can directly integrate that particular contract into the blockchain and once it's on the blockchain after mining there's no chance that that data can be tampered or anyone can try to alter the data because the thing here is ki the hacker needs to change each and every transaction happened in that particular block and come over to that particular transaction which he or she needs to hack so it becomes almost impossible for the hacker to make changes in this particular smart contract so this is one of the benefits which we can utilize in the real estate industry coming towards the benefits the speed efficiency and accuracy as we all know ki like it's being digitized so at a one click and a, at a one go you can easily transfer your land amount of sum of money or anything you want through these smart contracts and security obviously like the blockchain is highly secured version for storing the transactions as various hash keys are used and cryptographies are cryptographic functions are there which particularly stores the data on that particular blockchain so it makes almost hackers like all hackers are being aware ki this is not possible mostly because of the time and resources required to make changes in that particular blockchain coming towards the transparency and savings since there is no middleman involved in this thing so you can almost get the things or the smart contract being executed at a very minimal fee for this you only need to pay the amount in the form of a gas fee the gas fee is the particular fees which you pay to the chain which you are particularly using for preparing the smart contract mostly ethereum chain is being used to prepare the smart contract so there you need to use the eat token for making payment of the gas fee and executing that particular smart contract now coming towards ki how can you launch your own dao so for this there are three steps involved in launching a dao starting with creation of a smart contract then coming towards the funding and once you are having the funding you can definitely go for the deployment so dao particularly operates without the need for say any hierarchical management and can serve for variety of objectives so how can you create a dao so now dao can be created by a group of developers who can set or assign a set of rules can be there regulations can be there for a particular contract they are building accordingly that dao can be set up and once the dao is set up even the coders or the developers who have created that particular smart contract can't even make any change in that once they are done with creation of the dao they can introduce the tokens in that which can be utilized for the funding purpose so as and when the people and the users on that particular dao increases the funding they can get through selling these tokens exchanging trading them for various other fiat currencies cryptocurrencies like that once they are having a appropriate amount of funding they can proceed towards the deployment of that dao so dao is completely launched on the blockchain once everything has been set up now the stakeholders will make decisions of the organization's future the white paper is written particularly the deck is there the objectives of that dao is decided and depending upon the objectives white paper the users engage with that dao if they are interested then definitely they can go for it buy their tokens and that token can be considered as part of the ownership of their dao it, this helps them this can also be considered as an investment opportunity for these users uh, if a dao you can say raises to a particular scale then definitely they are going to earn a lot or you can say 100x amount of returns are being there it has already been happened in the past with these daos being in the marketplace now from dao coming towards the nft so what nft is nft is the non fungible token being used in the web3 space as we all know fungibility refers to the ability of an asset to be replaced or exchanged so the fungible asset may be replaced or exchanged for any other you can say portion or any other indistinguishable portion now coming towards the non fungibility so what's the advantage of non fungible tokens so the non fungible token is the main advantage is the rarity it holds that particularly thing is ki it can't be replaced or exchanged uh, 
it's the polar opposite of the fungibility token or you can say the ft so the nft holds the rarity which makes it more valuable and easy to be used in the web3 space as the antique like you can say for the autographs are there and various other books are there rare artworks are there they hold a particular value and the rarity of them is key like they are only the single piece of collection present in the whole world now so that this particularly rarity is maintained throughout their journey what can be done is ki these artworks can be converted to digital arts in the form of nfts these non fungible tokens can be further traded by various users on nft marketplaces present in the web3 space where nft marketplaces there you can post your nft through blockchains in blockchain again there can be various blockchains used for the purpose solana is there matic of polygon is there ethereum is there cardano is there avalanche is there so using these particular blockchains or you can say cryptocurrencies you can post your nft on marketplace such as zeribal open sea like that once you have posted your nft you can directly sell it to the users through the cryptocurrency this gives you a rarity and increases the value of your fund nft nft tokens so how you can make like use these tokens is in the industry of you can say entertainment industries there art industries there sports culture industries there where the rarity holds a significant value for the users in the industry of entertainment there are various movies being launched so the posters of these particular movie series are being converted into the form of nfts which are again being sold at various high prices you can say in hundreds and millions of dollars so there was a nft being launched by bode yacht club so that was particular nft which held value of more than million dollars so this is the kind of hype nft is having in the web3 space it particularly help the user to keep a digital collection for their belongings now again it depends upon the particular artist or the developer to sell that particular nft with the physical good or just the digital artwork they are willing to provide to the customer so in this way they can even hold the original artwork with their property and as well as sell the digital artwork helping them to earn in both the ways physically as well as digitally so now how to make sure ki nft is being particular the nft is having the authenticity or you can say transparency is there for that particular nft that it is a real token which is only present in a single amount in particular like you can say in whole world coming to the authenticity there are various use cases through which you can ensure that this nft is real for this what you can do is ki have a qr code which can be scanned to check the product history this history is being used maybe in the supply chain history where you can also have look of data present in it and suppose the carbon credits consumed even you can directly donate to the particular family of the workers who have created the nft the artisans are there then various monuments are being built so the construction workers are there you can directly don donate your the amount of money you are willing to do through these particular nfts by checking the and scanning the nft and having look at the data so again coming to the use case of nft nft is being used in the real estate industry for the transfer of land titles as we discussed earlier then for the history or like vehicle history also we are using the nfts again then one of the most important advantages for the ticketing purpose there are various times when you are buying a ticket for large events and the fraud or forgery chances are there so here again you can use the nft so now nft can be used like that is key once you have minted that particular nft you can directly show that on the counter and there is going to be a qr code present so qr code is unique for each and every nft being minted once you show the qr code you can easily access the history of that particular token created this will give you a fair idea ki the forgery and fraud can be removed from the particular system in the ticketing space as well as well as, as well as it will limit entry to that particular amount of person depending upon the ticket size so ip is used in the nft space uh you can say intellectual property rights are also being there used in the nfts so nft often provides the processor with a set of privileges you can say ki like common nft rights are there which can be 
held to exhibit particular art or you can say get access to unique content and transfer or sell your rights. This can be done for the trading of NFT purpose. This add value to the holders like who have created their online presence around that art and also simultaneously increasing the value of that particular underlying asset. This is one thing. So now in Web3 space, another one of the most important thing is the communities. As it is a decentralized function or a decentralized space, everything depends on the users present in this space. So the community plays a key role for deciding key how the that particular NFT, you can say DAO, blockchain, cryptocurrency is going to perform. Depending upon the interest of the users, you must first create a compiling value offer. Ki what exactly value you are adding to that ecosystem and how the users are going to be benefited. So this is the one of the most main advantage the communities is going to be looking for. You can say the people who are looking to join the community will go through the incentives and rewards which are being provided to them and what most they can make out of that particular community or the platform which they are engaging with. This is one of the important thing being used in the crypto space or Web3 space, the community building. So there are various brand ambassadors are there, champions are there who will promote the value of a collection to their network through the prospective consumers and dedicated followers will be present, the community will be there. Now again, coming to the exclusivity and the uniqueness as we have discussed earlier, Ki this will give us a fair idea for the exclusivity and rarity of the NFT. Now coming towards the underwriting thing. So underwriting is the procedure through which a person can or organization assume the financial risk in exchanging for a fees. So storing value for that particular project. So in NFT collection, we can directly ensure that as an underwriter, we can put that collection into an underwriting pool. Uh, from the NFT space, now we are shifting towards the metaverse, which is the, again one of the most key component of the Web3 space. So as we all are aware that Facebook has changed its name from the Facebook to Meta. So now what particularly Metaverse is? Uh, Metaverse you can say is a virtual system or a virtual earth being created by various uh, consume like a solution builders, tech giants, where you can directly interact with the people virtually at your own convenience using the head headsets are being used AR, VR technology, XR technology is being involved in creating the metaverse place. So metaverse is a place where you can have a free play, you can do entertainment can be there, explore the particular world accordingly, depending upon the objectives involved and the, yeah. So now what particularly metaverse is key? Metaverse can be even used for earning money through the games as well as entertainment. There are various options available such as learn to one platforms are there, move to one platforms are there in the virtual world through the metaverse space where you can even earn money while playing games. This has all been possible through the Web3 space. So interesting experiences being specific to the metaverse through virtual events are there, simulations are there, digital objects are also there. And then again, coming towards from the investment point of view, cryptocurrencies involved in these metaverse and in these virtual real estate, you can say through NFTs are being exponentially increasing and giving exponential returns of 3x, 10x, 20x like that. But again comes the volatility with these particular investments being made. So starting with the metaverse, but one of the most important metaverse or you can say key metaverse is the Roblox. It's the gaming metaverse being used in the USA. It's a platform where millions of users are playing online games. And the advantage is that they are able to create and personalize their avatars with skins. And in this way, they are even earning money in the form of particular token present on that Robux platform. So this token is being again used for the in-game purchases, then spending these tokens and even trading these tokens for the fiat currencies. This is all being possible through the metaverse. So as you can see, like the hype or you can say the engagement of metaverse or the Roblox has increased a lot from you can say 200 to million users and there are almost 50 million daily active users. So this is the exponential increase you can 
see for the metaverse and the coming web3 technology in which people are quietly engaged and fascinated about now another metaverse present is the sandbox metaverse and this is the metaverse used in the real estate purpose for buying the virtual land and get a amazing gaming experience so sandbox virtual metaverse is built on the ethereum blockchain in which gamers can create control and monetize their gaming experience as well as various corporations are being involved in this influencers are there and various other users are there who are claiming the nfts based on the real estate plots being there present in this sandbox metaverse so there is another metaverse called the commerce metaverse it's the world's first metaverse present for the e-commerce space so in this metaverse people are buying lands on that particular metaverse where they are setting up their stores and engaging users to come and gain a amazing online experience for interacting with people in the 3d or a virtual space through the heads uh, headsets uh you can see the exe infinity metaverse now exe infinity is a great company which is being used particularly in the video game space and they have created a nft based video game so this video game is again built on the ethereum blockchain and ethereum plus you can say it's a run in side chain as well the side chain is particularly used to decrease the gas fees and the transaction times right the ethereum is having a limit of that particular transactions being stored in a seconds so the side chain is being used for making other transactions and reducing the gas fee so on exe infinity metaverse you can also trade the real money in the gaming marketplace and many people and gamers are using this metaverse for even earning their daily income and full time working as a full time gamer in the exe infinity metaverse coming to decentralized so decentralized is again based on the ethereum application and it is being used by various users for the virtual shared space decentralized is also similar to various other metaverses which are being used for engaging people to play games explore the virtual environment and again buying and selling digital real estate virtual lands are present space are present again the token here uses the land token it's a nft which is used for defining the ownership of that particular real estate or a digital real estate land you are owning a mana mana cryptocurrency is there which is being used to buy that particular land in the decentral land so depending upon the use cases they have created their own cryptocurrency which can be traded through various platforms present such as binance is there kraken is there and gate.io is there these exchanges are being used for trading the cryptocurrency and earn from these cryptocurrencies through the gaming uh we will be now discussing the few case studies uh depending upon the hype and the web3 space coming up the facebook has already been transformed towards the meta so the meta has already spent billions of billions of dollars for creating data centers for these metaverses so they will be developing a complete metaverse through the oculus so the oculus is the headset which they are using for the ar vr purpose through which you will be able to directly access the metaverse for this they are also recruiting top talent their responsibility is they are like they are aiming to assuring accountability in few critical areas then economic opportunities are present privacy safety integrity and fairness also are included in this meta and then creators of content so particularly they are creating this meta for the creator community which directly through which directly the creators can engage and share their content and which can be monetized so it's been shown by the various reports that metaverse could be around 13 trillion dollar economy by 2030 this was as estimated by city bank so various other use cases for metaverse are being involved there are shopping accessories for the digital avatar virtual real estate as we discussed you can even have virtual office meetings where your avatar can enter the metaverse and connect with the particular meeting or a workspace and then again you can present there through the avatar and this all can be done at the convenience site where you can where you are sitting suppose you can have this at your home office place or anywhere when you are traveling then the e-commerce as we told this can be there 
ad tech platforms are also coming with their metaverses to give a immersive classroom experience at the convenience of the students events and gatherings are already taking place the, there was many events conducted in past during the pandemic times in the metaverse space where the celebrities had their avatars being performing on the stage and the audience and the spectators were also in the form of avatars who bought the ticket through nfts and attended those events digital arts and collectibles are being like created in these metaverses and advertisement is also one of the key things or a monetary benefit or a revenue generation stream which can be there in the metaverse so many clients and companies are using the spaces present in the metaverse similar to the real world to make ads monetize that particular space and earn revenue from there gaming is there and dating is also one of the industries which is evolving over the metaverse so as we discussed about the elements the digital currency is also the one of the key elements present there and assets are present nlp is being used now coming towards the identity in the metaverse so one of the key advantage in the metaverse is that you can hide your real identity and be a pseudonymous person who can be present in the metaverse with the avatar this gives you a, this gives you a fair advantage to explore the regions where there is a risk or you can say the regions involving the war zones if you want to go there through the metaverse you can directly access that particular place or surrounding through the pseudonymous names or if you want to make the particular entry in the event where you don't want your name to be revealed this can be done through the metaverse space the autonomy or you can say the right to access is also essential for the functional society so for the privacy purpose the metaverse can be used your avatars can attend these events and the the identity revelation can be prevented there depending upon the ownership and the capacity to verify the property ownership for these like for example you can say it must be linked to a particular function function person so there would be no way to correlate property as well as the ownership between do these two various other persons present or the assets present in the metaverse yeah then technologies which are empowering the metaverse involves the cryptography is there blockchain is there then ar and vr definitely is being used in the metaverse internet of things also plays a major role because the devices are there the headsets which are being used are directly connected to the internet for accessing these metaverses as well as key 5g technology is required because a fast internet connection will be necessary for accessing the metaverse as these are being created on the high level 3d graphic versions involving the augmented reality 3d experience for a immersive 3d experience a high and a minimized latency internet connection is required now as we all know ki like jack dorsey from the twitter the founder of twitter is creating his own web5 so what particularly web5 is ki he is creating a web5 space similar to the web3 a completely different web5 which involves the decentralized monetary network as well as the slew of technologies to establish a whole new ecosystem of decentralized identities and data storage so the main or objective of this particular web5 is to have a data storage as well as decentralized identities for this purpose jack dorsey is also creating his own metaverse called web5 for this he has already invested billions of money and already involved or onboarded vcs for creating the web5 decentralized web uh, so their web5 mission is to produce one kind of collection of tools built on bitcoin that will transform the financial system as we know so this will enable the investors as well as the people to preserve their own data and maintain control of all their relationships and whatever data they want to reveal they can decide accordingly and the authority remains in the user side whatever they want to reveal they can do that as well as hide depending upon the person to person thing now coming towards the pillars of web web5 so web3 is already a new space and then coming to web5 it becomes a difficult for people to directly jump to the web5 so for this 
there are various research and development in process to come up with the clear objectives of how web 5 will be introduced and what exactly the key features are present but one of the key features is the decentralized identifiers or you can say dids which are only dependent on the bitcoin blockchain and nothing else so there is no need to build the new network which various other companies are building or any or requiring any other chain present in the ecosystem so directly you can use everything present on the bitcoin and a layer can be created on top of it which directly have the proposal of this web type web5 space now as we know ki like this cryptocurrency is being adopted by various countries and the issue is ki what particularly reasons are there for the improvement of improving the payment system efficiency minimizing the payment system risk increase access to the financial services and improving the cross border payments for all these things we are using the central bank digital currencies or you can say the cbdcs this is the map showing ki where cbdcs are being in the stages there are research stage being present in the usa proof of con concept is being developed then pilot launching has already been done and various countries are there where the cbdc has already been launched so now we here we will be discussing some of the real life applications of cbdcs so here is the bahamas sand dollar so as we all know bahamas is present and bahamas is a country or a island with a minimal or no physical access of means of delivery so only digital channels are being used so for this in response to the increased operating expenses the bank branch network has been reduced so this is the reason 90% of the bahamians are also possessing the cell phones or you can say the mobile phone wallet capacity this was the research that in the 2017 so the bahamas government plan to modernize the payment systems in their infrastructure this prompted the central bank of bahamas to initiate the sand dollar project in the trial phase through which they created their own cbdc currency which can be directly used for trading and the peer to peer transactions for the bahamian citizens another project is the singapore's project ubin so singapore as we all know is the highly advanced country in the field of technology as well as the fintech and banking service so it has various great mode of modern payment systems and banking service for the population as well as it acts as a center in for the asia for fintech purpose connecting the europe and the us region so excellent mobile and fixed internet infrastructure has helped the enabling this particular modernization for the fintech in the singapore country so the singapore has one of the greatest internet penetration rate as well in the world with more than 91% coverage now the singapore monetary authority or you can say mos found that international settlement network was able to be done quicker and in less expensive transaction compared to the traditional cross border pay, cross border payments being made for this they launched a particular project which was named ubin 26 so in this project they are researching and developing a cbdc currency for a multi currency payment platform which can be used for the transfer of cross border payments now again coming to another real life application or case study there is the bank of england so in the bank of england has the issue of declining notes present in the country privately issued money or you can say other payment methods increasing this was the issue the bank of england was facing for this they came up with the solution for using the cbdc so it aspires to deliver a safe and more trustworthy form of money to consumers companies and you can say financial system as an alternative to privately produced digital money in june 2021 boas issued a cbdc discussion paper in which it requested public input and suggestions so this is again in the pilot testing phase after the research and development for launching their own cbdc in the future then students e krona is there so sweden is having their currency called krona this is like sweden is one of the world's most sophisticated digital economies as we all are aware of so the cash use has decreased dramatically a lot or drastically in the last decade so this was a uh, raising worries about the access to government bag money as well as the safety and effectiveness of domestic payments so for this the sweden government or the 
central banks present there have decided to launch the CBDCs or you can say e-krona for major payment gateways and this can be used for directly digital payment and again the cross-border transfer of payments. So this will help them develop and improve their central bank's currencies autonomy. Then Canada has also launched their project called Canada Jasper project. So the Bank of Canada is again focusing on the usage of CBDCs. It is being used as a backup plan that can be integrated in future if any particular solid problem or there is a particular thing arises with the current solution being integrated in the market or if there are the fall of cash is there or any other currencies being increasing the digital payment or the cryptos then they can definitely planning to launch their own cbdc's then various other projects are also involved in this bis project of dunbar is there china's digital yuan also being introduced and turkish lira is there so these all, this, you can have a look at these CBDCs being there. The case studies are available on the internet for a research purpose. Again, now coming to Indian digital rupees. So India has also announced for the introduction of the digital version of their rupee in the initial budget, which was launched on 1st February 2022. So now we are expecting some more clarities and the regulations about the cryptos of the adaption of crypto in the Indian market and how it will gonna affect the Indian digital economy. And it will also lead to more efficient and cheaper currency management system. So now coming towards some of the most performing cryptocurrency of 2021, as we all are aware about the Shiba Inu coin was present. So particularly it was called the Dogecoin killer. And there were various controversies also present with the Shiba Inu, but it was one of the top gainer present in the 2021 market of the crypto era. In the October, like the cryptocurrency also reached the all-time high as the numbers are mentioned in this PPT. Also, it was trading at a huge volume and many people were trading in it. Then there was a coin called Terra or you can say Luna, which was drastically dumped in the last past month, you can say two or three months. The Luna crash was there as we all are aware of. It also decreased the value of cryptocurrency a lot, as well as billions of rupees were exhausted, billions of dollars were exhausted in this Luna crash. So this was the currency which gained almost 14,000% in the previous year. So this is the level of, you can say, returns which can be gained through the cryptocurrency market. Then XZ Infinity also traded their particular token, which was trading around 0.53 dollar and the, it gained access and then again it was around 94 dollar per token in January 2022 almost 12,000 percent returns in a single year then Solana is there Solana blockchain is also present which is having various use cases its market cap is also worth millions of dollars and Bitcoin as we all know has gained a quite uh, valuability in particular the cryptocurrency space you can say increasing from 28,000 and also it went to all time high of around 68,700 USD making almost trillion dollar of particular Bitcoin economy yeah so again now there are various terms being used in the web3 space as mentioned in the PPT also you can have a look at these terms or the glossary for your reference and are available in the internet. I can share the link on after end of the session. So thank you guys. This was all about the Web3 space we discussed. This was about the crypto, metaverse, blockchain, NFT, CBDC, decentralized finance, everything included in a single session. I hope you liked the session. Thank you so much. Thanks, Akhil. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, from the concepts of Web3, how the evolution of Web3 that has taken place and, uh, you know, how the way you explained the concepts of metaverse and the way uh, you gave us insights on the fintech, uh, 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 the coins and how it's based on blockchain. So it was uh, indeed a very wonderful session that we witnessed. Sir. So uh, uh, please give me one moment over here. Uh, I would like to request the participants to please wait for one moment.
Yes. So we are going into the uh, second section of our uh, event today. That is the debate. Web 3.0 Fiesta section debate is going to be started now and it's almost seven o'clock. So we're going to uh, start off with the session right now. Um, the debate section of the event is sponsored by IoT AGI and Covalent. IoT uh, AGI is pro providing 3000 rupees as cash price to the winners of the debate and all the participants of the uh, debate finale get uh, official merch from Covalent. So going forward, the these four people are the debate finalists and they are divided into two teams. And team four consists of Manav Diwari and Srinjai Shres. And team against consists of Mohammed Abu Bakar Siddiq and uh, Gurpreet Paul. So let me just read out the rules quickly for you. Each participant gets a time limit of five to seven minutes and they have to adhere to this time limit. And uh, after the participant's speech, the other opponent... Uh, excuse me. Yeah, so the opponent can send... Opponent team can send one member, only one member from their team to counter-argue with the speaker. And once uh, their uh, session... In, once the speaker's uh, speech is done, uh, the next speaker will be called upon from the uh, opponent team. So there are brownie points given to the team which can cite their proofs and sources. The moderator has uh, authority over stopping the speaker whenever he can and whenever he feels uh, the content has been inappropriate and it's not rele uh, relevant to the topic. So I would like to call upon uh, uh, Amok sir to take over the session and introduce the topic to the speakers. Thank you. Hello, Akil. Thank uh, you so hi. much, everyone, uh, for for joining in today. And uh, it's definitely my pleasure to be here with all of you this evening and Akil's debate that we're going to have today. But uh, before that, let's let's start off with a quick introduction of the four speakers itself. And, and we have uh, two teams that they have been divided into. So first off, I'll, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Manav Tiwari for, for giving a quick five to 10 seconds introduction of himself. All right, and my name's Manav Tiwari and I'm a student at IIT Madras BS degree. And I'm also a student at Polytechnico di Torino, Italy. Awesome. Welcome, Manav. Thank you so much for your interest. It's a pleasure being here and on speaking on such a great topic. So <laughs> thank you so much for this opportunity. That's amazing. Looking forward to the debate session, Manav. So next up, uh, we have the second speaker, and uh, that is Mohammed Abu Bakr Siddiq. Yeah, hello. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Mohammed Abu Bakr Siddiq. Abu Bakr, can you do? Yes. Hello? Hello, yeah, uh, I'm Mohammed yes. Abubakar Siddiq. You can uh, call me Abu, actually. And uh, I'm a student at IIT Madras, and I'm pursuing a BS in data science. And uh, well, I'm 18, and uh, I run a software slash publishing company. And I'm excited to join you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Abu Bakar, for joining in today. Sure. So the next speaker for today is uh, Shrinjai. And he's from the fault team there. And I'd like to invite uh, Shrinjai for giving a quick introduction about himself. Hey, everybody. This is Shrinjai Shresh. Uh, I'm basically from Lucknow, Uttar Pradesh. I'm currently enrolled in the foundational level of the IITM BSD program for data science and programming. And I'm really, really looking forward for a very productive debate out there. Same here, Shrinjai. Looking forward. To the debate and your uh, session as well. So the next up, uh, we have Gurupreet Paul, who will be speaking from the team against. And uh, I'd like to hear your quick introduction, Gurupreet. Hello, uh, I'm Gurupreet Paul. Um, I come from Faridabad. I was born and brought up here. And uh, I love watching, uh, uh, I, I love uh, reading editorials and just in general, seeing 
wondering about how i can help the society by mastering technology basically i see uh, technology as a hammer to all of the nail to all of the problems with the society is having thank you so much gurpreet that was a wonderful introduction and uh, welcome welcome to the debate today so before starting out uh, i like to give or extend a warm welcome to all the speakers that we have today and uh, before jumping into the topic i'll just add in my thoughts as such for the event here the main goal for the debate session today is to give a full view to the speakers and help them understand what what web 3.0 is right because the audience today most of the audience or the members that have joined here would have known about web3 from social media or or from other places and it's just a very superficial level and they do not know the entire perspective that is the for and the against of the web3.0 as such so the main thought that i would like to give the uh, speakers today is that help them understand or give them an entire full fledged view of what web 3.0 is and let them decide for themselves if they want to jump in or not all right so that is with respect to the speakers as such but coming into the audience i'd like to mention that uh, the audience would have seen multiple debate sessions on uh, news first or or channels like republic and such and it will just be a heated debate there so that is not something that you're going to see here will just be a full fledged uh, perspective on what web 3.0 is and uh, we will allow you to make the decision if you want to jump in or not so that brings me to the topic for the session today and uh, it is specifically shifting from web 3.0 or do people need to shift to web 3.0 from web 2.0 all right the topic for the session is shift to web 3.0 from web 2.0 all right i hope all the speakers are clear with the topic there so if you have any doubt uh, you can just press in right now all right i hope uh, it's clear to the speakers so before starting the debate as such uh, i just brief on the rules again that was mentioned by our friend akil there so we have two teams that is the for and the against and one speaker from each team will come forward and talk for 5 to 7 minutes and after that one member will from the opposite team can jump in and put in their counter arguments as such and next we will have the second speaker coming up and he will again put in his arguments for 5 to 7 minutes and another member from the opposite team can come in and put in his counter arguments there so we will repeat this four times and at the end of the session we will open it up for the audience where they can ask questions maybe on on the chat section of youtube or the chat section of the zoom and anybody from both of the teams can come forward and answer those questions there and at the end we will close the debate and that is how this entire session will go forward today all right so wishing all the very best to our speakers on the podium today i would like to start off with the first speaker himself and he will be speaking the topic in favor of the for and the topic as i mentioned again is is the shift to web 3.0 from web 2.0 really necessary and what are your thoughts on the same is something that manav tiwari will be talking to us about so i'd like to hand over the stage to manav tiwari for explaining his thoughts on shifting from web 2.0 to web 3.0 specifically over oh, to you manav thank you so much 
for your wonderful words. And I'd like to start with a brief introduction. So in this digital age it comes with its own lexicon, bewildering arrays of buzz phrases, words and acronyms, designs to confuse as much as they inform. So for instance, many people use the term, the web and the internet interchangeably when they are in fact two different things. Furthermore, there have been more than one version of the web. Are you intrigued yet? If not, then let me get started. The most important event following the establishment of the internet network was the web, introduced by, as we all know, Tim Berners-Lee. And in the last five years, we have seen some drastic changes in the use of the web. User wants to participate, like as we call the web version 1.0, it was just a bunch of web pages using HTML. And now we are on the stage of web 2.0. And we have seen some drastic changes. User wants to participate in content sharing. They like to interact with each other. They're, this is, as we know, web 2.0. And the progression can be best recognized in the rise of social media. Facebook in particular, shows all the characteristics of 2.0. It's constantly updating the information you see by accessing database. The, the information often comes from the user-generated post and discussion. Twitter, as we all saw in the workshop, is another example. Instead of 3.0, they're aiming for the 5.0 mark but it's dynamically generating presentations, data from online discussions, and Google Docs can also be counted as 2.0 applications when nobody thought that there was going to be a competitor for Microsoft Words. Now, the question arises, why? Why do we need a shift from 2.0 to 3.0? Why? Because people don't usually go with changes. But the thing is, humans are able to survive to different things just because they are adaptable to the changes. So in today's dominant internet platforms are building on exaggerating users and user data. And these platforms have grown. So has their ability to provide value thanks to the power of network effect, which has enabled them to stay ahead. For example, Facebook is now called Mate Meta data on, they are collecting data on user behavior and they have made such fine tuned algorithms to the point that it can content feed and target ads wherever dramatically, dynamically better than any other competitor. Meanwhile, other tech giants like Amazon have exploited and created great customer lines and logistics and their business model is taking huge advantage of them. And trust me, I do have a question. Do you all think that your data should be sold like this? Do you all think that your private information, which you were supposed to keep it to yourself, is getting sold upon and being targeted upon and you don't even know what's happening? That's why we need a shift from web 2.0 to web 3.0. And one of the best defining feature, I think, is the decentralization of the net. This is the core tenet of Web 3.0. In Web 2.0, computers use hypertext transfer protocol in the form of unique web addresses to find information, which is stored generally over a single server. That means it has a single kill point. Whereas in Web 3.0, because the information was not be based on its content, would be stored in multiple locations simultaneously, and hence it would be decentralized. This would break down the massive database currently the companies are having and would lessen their influence on the other. With the Web 3.0, the data generated by increasingly powerful computer resources, including mobile phones, desktops, appliances, vehicles, sensors, 
will be sold to other users through decentralized data networks, ensuring that users retain ownership and control what they want to share and what they do not want to share. They can maintain their anonymity. Like, let me give you an example. Let's say if a digital artist, for example, claims that the artwork is only limited to 489 editions. Let's suppose if somebody releases an artwork in Web 2.0 this way, it is just going to get distributed. Whereas if on Web 3.0, if the artist says that it's only 489 editions, then it can verify it through directly through the blockchain that there are no further copies made. Then there are, there's one more branch that is trustless and permissionless. You don't need to ask for somebody's permission to post anything on Web 3.0. The network will allow all the participants to interact directly without going through a trusted intermediary. As we learned, like for not banking, there is no middleman or mediator. We can use smart contracts, blockchains, peer-to-peer -peer apps, decentralized apps, which are all going to help us build that Web 3.0. And most importantly, artificial intelligence and machine learning. In Web 3.0, computers will be able to understand information similarly to humans. It's just like Web 3.0 is just like democracy just for the internet. And I believe it is more connective and it has more ubiquity. With Web 3.0, information and contact are more connected. Ubiquitous accessed by multiple applicants using blockchain and they are secure. And with pandemic, we have yeah. seen- So okay. Manav, mm -hmm. yes, Manav, uh, that's, that's a okay. great, thought that you, you gave out on, on what Web 3.0 is there. But if you had to put it in one line, mm -hmm. what would you say uh, or, or why do you think the audience should jump into Web 3.0 from Web 2.0 specifically in I one line? I believe it's, it's just like for government, for the people. We are just moving from monarchy to democracy. We determine right. what data should be shared and what should not be shared. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Manu, for that uh, wonderful speech or the entire session that you put Thank out you. today. So next up, uh, if, if there's anyone from the against team that would like to counter Manu's argument, I'd like to invite them on the podium right now. Um, I would like to, uh, I'm, I'm having a counter question. Sure. Absolutely. Go ahead, Gurupit. But I would just like to discuss with my teammate uh, what his opinion is. Can I just get one minute? Oh, we, uh, like uh, we can create Gurpreet, break rooms. Uh, this session, uh, no. Uh, so this session, only one participant will be allowed from the opposite team to one. put in his thoughts. And uh, the speaker there will answer that specifically, right? Yeah. Or you can go ahead. Or, oh, yeah. and mention the entire or the flaws that was mentioned by the speaker during his session there, all right? Uh, so sorry. that is how we'll go forward. Go so uh, Manav, uh, as you were describing mm -hmm. about tokens and about the decentralization. Mm -hmm. So uh, like many of the Web3 boasters see themselves as the disruptors, but uh, token, uh, tokenize, many say, like uh, in the uh, workshop which we had heard earlier, mm -hmm. uh, of, to of tokenizing all the things. Mm -hmm. But don't you think it's the same mindset of, of the 1970s to marketize all of the things, of commercializing all of the things? I would like to hear your opinion on it. Uh, actually, I believe uh, rather than tokenizing, it's just distribution of power among different people. If they have collective vote, they can come together, join up. Otherwise, they can just, that, since that's the best part of decentralization, they are limited to their self and on different, different blockchains, different, different communities, they have their tokens and it's up to them rather than marketing. If they want to stay anonymous 
they can stay anonymous. But if they want to join, they want personalized experience, they can do that. But that totally depends upon the majority of what people think. That's what my opinion yeah, is on that. that. Yes. So, Gurpreet, did you have anything else to add there? Um, well, nothing else. Uh, nothing else. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Got it. So, did, did that quit? Did that answer specifically give give justice to the question that you asked, or uh, do you think we can move forward? Something more, but um, oh. well, uh, I I I have already a rebuttal prepared for it, so okay. uh, so it you have to wait for my turn. <laughs> Got it. All right, all right then. So that was the first speaker talking for shifting into Web three point zero from. Web 2.0. Thank you so much, Manav. And uh, next up, we have the team against coming up to put in their thoughts on why we shouldn't be shifting to Web 3.0 from Web 2.0. And we are going to hear or the speaker will give, it, give out his thoughts on the session there. And for that specifically, I'd like to invite uh, Mohammed Abu Bakr Siddiq and yes, the stage is all yours, Abu Bakr. Uh, thank you, Morad. That you have, yes, the topic that you have is why people shouldn't be shifting to Web 3.0 from Web 2.0 specifically. Sure. Thank you, moderator and uh, participants and speakers. And okay, uh, I'm gonna start off with you know uh, saying some words, right? These are all names of certain things. I'm gonna call. Okay, fine. American horror finance, Trump coin, Putin coin, and Doge coin. So these are all, you know, quite famous uh, cryptocurrencies out there. And they all add up to a whopping $143 million in uh, uh, fully diluted market cap, which is a huge amount of money. Now, uh, these when I told you, you may have uh, thought of, you know, these as movie names or, you know, names of memes. But no, these are actual financial projects uh, taking money from people and people invest, people invest in these coins and make money out of it. Now, this is what my problem is with Web3. I fully support the technology and I think the te technology is very impressive, but technology is not valuable until the implementation is nailed. And right now, we are too early for Web 3.0 is my opinion. I'll, uh, and I'll uh, further to this, right? I'll uh, go on to say that uh, the main problem with uh, Web 3.0 is that it creates a socio-economic divide. Uh, for example, in India, uh, the internet penetration is 41%. And we are, you know, we Jammu and Kashmir got a license to implement 4G, 3G, and 4G technologies about two years ago. So, in a country like India, which is the fifth biggest uh, country in terms of GDP, Jam, uh, entire state had has had access to uh, 3G technology for only the past two years. So, don't you think it's a bit of a leapfrog to jump from, you know, web? two to three immediately and you know jack dossies web five is probably a distant dream that will come about in the next hundred years but let's just talk about web three for now right um the government actually uh, we had virtual schools for a while but now uh, the government has opened all uh, schools again even even though they knew that risking you know they're risking people students lives do you know why that is it's because a lot of students in the rural communities in India did not have internet access, nor did they have mobile access. So they could not study. They were you know, trading off education because of lack of internet. So this is a huge leapfrog uh, action to jump from web two to three when web two has not even been implemented fully across the globe. Developed countries have it, some developing countries have it, but poor countries, simply do not have access to any of these technologies. And in fact, I'd like to uh, cite a quote, actually. Uh, give me a second. 
Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, in some sectors, there is fear that some of these technologies are never going to be re- never going to reach people who actually need them. This is from Akhtar Bacha, a UW professor. So these are people that are in need of this technology, but they don't get it. And you know, we're talking about decentralization of finance and uh, all these. Right now, they are just fancy buzzwords, but I'm sure they have real uh, implementation uh, scope. But right now, they are really just uh, fancy buzzwords because the people that need them don't have access to them. So the implementation is a, a huge hurdle for this. And second of all, speaking of uh, decentralization, as from the workshop, de- okay, decentralization means the, sep- the uh, I guess well, it's, it's quite uh, obvious in the term. But let me tell you this fact, 1,000 people own 40% of the Bitcoin market, meaning the 40% of Bitcoin's uh, net worth is concentrated into 40,000 people. That's not much different from the uh, economic system we have right now. That is not decentralization. That is re-centralization. We are simply moving away from money to digital currency, but there is no decentralization there. It is simply getting re-centralized, which is obviously a bit of a problem. And 50% of the crypto market is dominated by Bitcoin, out of which 40% is owned by a small group of people. This is, a, this is an extremely concerning situation because, again, it goes against the concept of decentralization completely. As well, uh, in the workshop, uh, it was, uh, smart contracts were mentioned and smart contracts and dApps were mentioned. And here's what Mark Cuban had to say about uh, smart contracts. He, he uh, talked about the regulation of smart contracts, and this is what he says. Smart contracts are the most likely source of fraud, intentional omissions, undisclosed actions, lack of clarity by users. I don't think smart contracts will need to be approved first. I think they'll be reported for fraud and will need certified audits to prove lack of fraudulent intent. Now, this is again the problem with uh, cryptocurrencies and alike technologies. The regulation of them has been always a nightmare. And recently, crypto regulations had had another uh, hammer on their head by uh, the Indian government uh, putting a further ban on them and further regulations on them because they were being used to fund anti-national activities. And these are are threats. Yes, Abu Bakr. Uh, Is that it? Yes, Abu Bakr. Uh, Those were great, great points made there. And... uh, Specifically with respect to the problems that are still there in Web 2.0 itself and Indeed, yeah. the centralization among small group of members in yeah. when when they claim that they are decentralized, right? I, I totally yeah. agree with things there. Thank so you. If, Thank if you had to put put this entire summary that you gave out in in one line, what would it be? Why why shouldn't people shift from Web 2.0 to Web 3.0 specifically. Um, well, okay. It, switching from Web 2.0 to Web 3.0 blindly is like saying, I will let the chimpanzee do surgery on you, but I don't know what the chimpanzee is thinking. So, Got it. Awesome. Great, great line you made there. Thank you. And yes, I'll, I'll just hand over the podium to the team for if, if they have any counter argument that they want to make against the claims and the session that Abu Bakr gave out sure. right now. I think uh, my friend Shrinja has something. So yeah, I'll request him to go forward with that. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Shrinja, we can hear so, you. So as in his point, he has mentioned that, uh, that smart contract are mm. kind of fraudulent stuff. They should not be implemented, right? Mm-hmm. Correct. Mm-hmm. But the main reason you cited was because of uh, its security uh, security implications with that, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm not aware of that. I'm aware that there are various methods, like there are static analysis method in which you look for any vulnerability in the code without executing it. Then there comes the dynamic analysis where you uh, analyze, sorry, you look for vulnerability after executing it. And there are various other tools 
which you use in order to remove any sort of vulnerability in this in your smart contract which includes like solograph uh, madmax or like manticore smart check and there are a whole lot of stuff a part of it sure. there are a part of it there are like in the in the various pilot projects there had been a uh, various ca- uh, cases of such incident where uh, smart contracts were targeted to for some malicious practice but but because of the since you all we all are i think aware that smart contracts basically work as the i could in a word i could say brain so like in 2016 i am citing this uh, example uh, Uh, there has been one attack in 2016 wherein uh, the uh, actually the wallet system which is under in the defi so the uh, hackers has actually targeted the wallet to send to actually take out all the money from that but it is because of the smart contract this entire decision process was made slow and the community uh, got the time to just reverse the transaction because of the white hackers mhm so we want to uh, ponder about it yeah like, no uh, is it really okay so here's the thing right smart yeah. contract the biggest problem with smart contracts is that they are not regulated they anyone i see i can post a smart contract and i can share it with you and you can download the smart But, contract and you can okay i know i know the, yeah go ahead okay I, i'm aware that i'm i'm sure that uh, you know uh, what you're saying is correct where uh, you say that there are technological reg- uh, regulations within smart contracts themselves but that is not the uh, case with you know uh, that, that is not the case first be, the reason is okay let me ask you this um, ethereum is a very big uh, smart contract platform right is it ethereum is, is yeah. it a- uh, abu bakar we are, we are running short of time so can you quickly answer the question there specifically in the sense why do you think smart contracts are still yeah, sure. vulnerable and what okay, are the security again, flaws that they have when the technology itself is very nascent the regulations we have for the technology are further nascent meaning hackers are always find a way to uh, exploit innocent users that via smart contracts and again they're not you say they are regulated technologically but indeed they're not because uh, a lot of scams have been happening pertaining to smart contracts particularly that's it thank you got it so basically your your uh, somebody there is that since they are not regulated they are still vulnerable to in the attacks yes. and things the regulations we have right so, now are not enough all right one so, more thing sir since like I, he uh, has one more thing i would like to yes. like he yes. has tried to draw some parallel between web 3.0 and the crypto which i don't think is the case because it is like same as the world wide web to internet they might look similar but they are not okay web 3.0 is uh, i, I it, believe is a it. much broader term mm mm-hmm, got it yeah, that was so yes my, that uh, was yes really thank you thank you so much got it thank you so much for your mm-hmm. counter argument there and and a great summary that you gave out uh, abu bakar as well thank you so thank you so much uh, both of you yeah. and uh, i i think the audience did hear On, on why they shouldn't be shifting from web 3.0 or from web 2.0 to web 3.0 because of the problems associated on the uh, verticals of web 2.0 itself and sure. decentralization again yeah so so i would like to invite the next speaker there to pitch in his thoughts on uh, why we actually need to make the shift from web 3.0 or or from web 2.0 to web 3.0 even when there are problems on the web 2.0 front itself because there are again any technology will have good sides and and bad sides associated with it what it is how people perceive things and it is how people make the best out of it so i'd like to hear from the next speaker that is srinjai on why we need to shift from the current web 2.0 technologies to web 3.0 as such over to you shrinjay uh, yeah so am i audible perfectly yeah so the i would like to start with a very uh, this i would like to put my point with a question 
who would like to pay a cut of their money for a procedure which could be done di uh, directly hand to hand for example uh, for example uh, in the various in the many uh, of the technology which has been started in the very uh, in the very early stage the big techs provide free services looks like they are so savior of the people but later on they use techniques to you know some to catch the people and let them pay them pay the fees which could be the case if the consumer and the business would directly be related and that is the case of web 3.0 where as agrim sir has said we would need very few or technically no intermediate people or any platform so there would be no central authority and you would it would be very transparent as uh, manav has said a part of it i would also like to uh, put before you all that in uh, web 3.0 uh, you will be able to search your information more efficiently and when you search for something on let's say on a search engine uh, it will end up showing you more relevant res uh, result as according to your query instead of uh, showing more popular searches that people click like example if i want to search for something i want the answer for my query i don't want to uh, get the answer of what people are thinking of so that is the case of web 3.0 which is presently not a, a feature of web 2.0 a part of it uh, a term which agrim sir has used in his presentation the semantic web which is also a part of web 3.0 and this will end up helping better connectivity of online data throughout all its node so what it will end up is you will end up uh, saving much more time while searching and you could focus as a human you could end up focusing on more productive tasks than rather just surfing on internet looking for your ideal query a part of it since web 3.0 use machine learning and artif artificial intelligence so the web would be able to recognize your preferences and it will be able to give the best fit of your answer for example if you would like to book tickets let's say so you have to go for n number of sites look for the best deal out there and there is a chance in that process you would end up losing hell lot of data to the uh, uh, let's say hackers so just because of your initiative you are ultimately targeting your own digital signature on the net a part of it like recently i would like to quote a al, Jaze al jazeera article like uh, it is there like the russian has uh, the russian cyber criminals has down the satellite internet in ukraine so the entire entire satellite internet infrastructure of ukraine has been down by these criminals cyber criminals which gives one of the most significant i could say plus point of web 3.0 that is uninterrupted service so since the, the whatever the data is there is stored on distributed network so the user will not have to think about let's say suspension of any particular account or service disruptions which could be technical could be natural but whatever be the case he will he will he do not have to care about the interruption a part of it let's say in the in the age of entrepreneurship you are an entrepreneur uh, and let's say as uh, in the very first arg uh, argument the counterpart has said social economic divide he has quoted that term correct imagine uh, that entrepreneur is from a remote village or let's say a remote area where he where he do not have the access of let's say a, a very large marketing brand to help him to that so with the help of artificial intelligence he or she would be able to create a better bond between the consumer and himself and his product and he would be able to market that product in a much better way to the interested buyer themselves so i would uh, i would argue that this procedure would end up uh, giving more viable outcome for the consumer as well as for the brand itself and ultimately the entrepreneur a part of it i would like also like to focus on the one of the most uh, important feature of web 3.0 that is it provides a better and secure computing fabric what i mean by that is uh, the entire network is based on peer to peer architecture which as manav said makes it decentralized but a part of it it also make it efficient 
fast and economically viable in the longer run. I would also like to uh, put forward a uh, few of the technical aspects of Web 3.0, which I personally favor, is that it internationalized the web languages. And it, it uh, answers a very important demerit of Web 2.0, that is interoperation of machines on the web. A part of it, uh, since it is diverse, so the workload and the data management becomes much more easier for the system and ultimately the user using IA, that is intelligent agents, which is backed by ontology web languages. Part yeah, of it, we all are know, we, we all are knowing yes. that. Uh, I will just I would like to like uh, conclude, I guess. So yes, one of the very uh, in the various uh, in the very first presentation, Agrim sir has mentioned about augmented reality, extended reality, metaverse, which uh, which comes under the web 3.0, and I believe it could be used to supplement the present education, if not completely uh, trust, uh, bypassing it. What I mean is by that is we can create a simulated experience for the child to uh, let's say. For example, if we are teaching about human digestive system, so we can create a model wherein we could make him enter in, in our uh, digestive system, look at the, uh, of, uh, let's say, any organ, so that ultimately he could get a better understanding of that. A part of it, uh, I would also like that, to uh, mention. Yes, Shinja. That... Shinja, yes. Uh, like, that, that was a great example that you gave out at the end as well. So before moving on, I'd like to ask you again, uh, what would be your one line on why people need to shift to web 3.0 from web 2.0 specifically? Like in one line. Because why do you want why do you want other uh, why do you want other to cater you cater you need? Your power should be in your hand. Got it. That's so how giving power like back to the people is people. Your because there. that's how we have we have, as Manav has said, that's how we have transitioned from monarchy to the democracy. Got it, got it. Totally agree yeah. there. And great points made with regards to the last last example that you gave out, as well as the uh, distributed infrastructure that could be built up and uh, the peer-to-peer -peer network that could be efficient as well as faster in, in terms of resolution and a lot of other verticals as well. So thank you so much uh, for your pitch there. And I'd like to move into the team against if, if you had any counter arguments with respect to the specific points that Srinjai made, it's, it's your time now. Sure. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I'll go. And uh, Shunjai, your your summary for your talk was that uh, you know you want to give the power back to the people, and that I'll pose two questions by the way, and uh, you can answer them as, uh, one after the other, right? So my first question would be regarding your uh, summary. You mentioned that you need to give power back to the people, power of data back to the people, and yet you also mentioned that Web 3.0 provides you with personalized services which depend on AI and ML which ultimately depend on people's data, which yeah. I believe, you know, goes against your uh, summary and okay, well, the concept of decentralization or rather uh, the concept of privacy that Web 3.0 would provide. And second of all, you mentioned, you also mentioned that uh, uh, socioeconomic divide, right? Uh, the socioeconomic policy, uh, the socioeconomic concept would be improved by Web 3.0. But uh, my argument is that due to the Ill implementation of the 3.0, there'll be more people getting affected than benefited. For example, I'll give you an example of uh, El Salvador, the country that invested a lot of money into Bitcoin. In fact, 15% of the company's GDP was in invested into Bitcoin and the country lost $63 million in one and a half years. That is huge for a country that says. Yes, Abu Bakr of... So the basic points were with respect to privacy and personalization there, right? Yes, pretty much. Got yes. it. So yes, uh, Srinjai, yes, Srinjai, yeah. uh, how, how would you like to go forward yeah. with it? So for all the privacy, privacy issues, there is a concept called zero trust architecture, which is, uh, I would like to cite this from uh, whatever point I'm making about uh, this zero trust architecture. Uh, this is uh, from uh, 
a, a research paper which was uh, published by the Cluth Institute of United Kingdoms, and it was uh, published on May 2015, and it is named the Journal of Applied Business Research. So, according, uh, what does it uh, suggest? Because this is a possible security uh, privacy threat. So, in zero trust architecture, what happens is, it, uh, like, it is an approach wherein no device, no user, no algorithm, no nothing, any system is uh, perceived to have a particular uh, resources. So, what I mean by that is, uh, is it isn't just an approach to identity, uh, identity and access management. And that assumes that uh, any relevant and every relevant identity, any relevant point which is there on the system needs a you know, standard of verification and authentic authentication uh, uh, before that. A part of that, no outsider, you know, any outside uh, node which is not in the system should be able to trigger any ch ch uh, changes to the system before, authentic uh, be before verification. So I think that uh, uh, that you as you said uh, the privacy uh, yeah, factor uh, is yes Sanjay, sure. I believe uh, you're referring to the uh, concept of black box AI and the reason what? it was uh, I'm assuming I, I think you're referring to the concept of black box AI where uh, the nodes are completely hidden and uh, no, the no, no 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 uh, zero trust architecture is a whole different thing. Yes, that is black box AI. The, the colloquial term for that no. is black box AI. Got it. So yeah. basically, uh, with a few things on, on two different technology stacks there, but mm -hmm. uh, the underlying problem is again with privacy and security, right? So yeah, then, exactly. uh, going going back to Srinjai. So Srinjai, if you yeah. had to give an Yeah, I have, I have there, another point. Yeah, yes. I have more points. Just so, uh, one like, line. Yeah. Uh, just one line. Uh, what do you want to put in? With, with respect to privacy and security yeah. on Web 3.0. So recently we have this uh, Taiwan Malware Analysis Net, TWMA and Tomman, okay. which is mm -hmm. speci specifically built to cater all these things. Then we have IA powered firewalls. Then we okay. have this uh, validation of input Got concept, it. which, which so allows no are... SQL injections. Yes, yeah. there are there are a lot of technologies that are coming up, and and yeah. there's a lot of work. And a part of being that, a part of that, that since since it has not been in in even in the early adoption phase, so with the gradual uh, time, it, it the educate the consumer or the people will ultimately get enough education to at least be safe from their side at first. Okay. Then so basically, you are uh, relying on the people of, again. Uh, Yes, relying on the people again yes. for, for those things. Got it. From, yes, Shinzai, there is, uh, but a part of that, there is done, also done. enough technologies from the Got connection it. side to yes, make Shinzai. them secure. Yeah. Yes, yes. So uh, I I think uh, Abu Bakr, that was that was a rough uh, that Shinjai gave for your question out there. Uh -huh. And then yes, uh, yeah, let's let's move forward on, on the uh -huh. debate now. Right? Uh, so yes, as uh, Shrinjai mentioned there, that Web 3.0 would give in uh, a distributed infrastructure and a peer-to-peer -peer network that could be efficient. But we have the next speaker coming up on, on why Web 3.0 could not or, or will not make the push into the mainstream adoption. And I'd love to hear uh, Gurpreet's thoughts on why the shift from Web 2.0 to Web 3.0 should not be made and, and the associated arguments with it. Over to you, Gurpreet. Um, so I would like to begin by the words of George Orwell, who spoke 1984, describing the life of people in society under the ominous present of the big, big brother. It was terribly dangerous to let your thoughts wander when you were in any public place or within range of a telescreen. The smallest thing could give you away. A nervous tick, an unconscious of, society, of anxiety, a habit of muttering to yourself, anything that carried the suggestion of abnormality. So good evening, everybody. I'm Gurpreet Paul speaking against the motion for the topic shift to web 3.0 from web 
So in an overview, I would be grappling with three uh, problems. Uh, the first one is the bandwidth problem. The second one is the excessive decentralization. And the third one is the storage problem. But before I would move on to my own arguments, I would like to respond to my uh, uh, fellow participants, uh, um, Manav Tiwari, and uh, uh, about his answer on tokens. So uh, I totally disagree with his opinion uh, that he has on tokens. Uh, one of the, because somewhere I do feel, and according to Stephen Dial, who is a very famous computer scientist based in UK, he describes it as the hyper-financialization of all human existence, where market now provides a financial token game for every meme, every celebrity, every political movement, and every bit of art and culture, which is feeding the system. And secondly, I would also like to give my rebuttal of uh, Shiranjay's opinion, uh, where he was describing uh, the shift of, of uh, from 2.0 to 3.0, uh, and I'm quoting him, to search more efficiently according to our own preferences. And he also uh, went on to say that uh, uh, somewhere th Web 3.0 is also trying to inter inter internationalize the internet. But I do think that all of these, this is not a compelling enough, uh, you know, uh, thing for me to shift from 2.0 to 3.0 because all of these things are already there. I mean, we can already search more effectively and there's always already uh, inter internationalization of the internet. So they didn't, they weren't compelling enough for me. So, so with that out of the way, I would now uh, like to present my main arguments. So there's of inconvenient truth about the bandwidth problem of both computers and human resources. Blockchain solutions are vastly more expensive to maintain than the centralized solutions. The carbon footprint of a single Ethereum transaction as of December 2021 was 102.38 kilograms of CO2, which is equivalent to the carbon footprint of 226,900 visa transactions or 17,000 hours of watching YouTube according to Digic Economics. Thus, centralization always wins purely from its ability to physically serve data over network to consumers more effectively. For this hypothetical proposed decentralized Facebook, there's several inescapable logistic open-ended questions where, uh, which are left to answer. Now, who will pay for global data centers? So these are some of the questions which we have to, uh, where, where no one is ready to answer and we have to just see. Which brings me to my second point of excessive decentralization. All of us know that a protocol moves much more slowly than a platform. Even after more than 30 years, email is still unencrypted. Meanwhile, WhatsApp went from unencrypted to fully end-to-end -end encryption in a year. People are still trying to standardize sharing video reliably over internet relay chat. Meanwhile, iMessages lets us create custom reaction emojis based on our face. Now, this isn't funding issue. There's a lot of funding. But if something is truly decentralized, it becomes very difficult to change and often remains stuck in time. And which brings me to my third and the final point. There's a notion of storage problem, which taps at the heart of many like 
Kevin Rose of the New York Times, who argue it of the, of the storage problem being the biggest societal question of the 21st century. He questions about who owns our data. Web3, the Web3 narrative is incredibly anti-ethical to the notion of data deletion because the technical underpinning of append only and immutable databases don't admit this operation by design. Yet, every new business model must cross the bridge about customer data visibility. And these are the questions that are not about consens consensus algorithm, distributed databases, or even for the matter, cryptography at all. They are inescapable questions about power, privilege, and access. So in conclusion, according to me, Web3 is that technical manifestation of this empty grasping of many CI kick solutions that's going to solve all our problems. It's entirely rational to want to build a more decentralized technology stack and to aspire to a more egalitarian internet, a more equitable society and a better world. However, Web3 is not the golden path that leads us to that world. It's the same old crypto nonsense, just packed in a sugar pill to make it easier to digest. The choice, is ours. the choice is ours. Do we want a democratic internet, which we had thought of in the 90s, which we are now referring to Web 1.0, or no. the yes, internet, which Orwell has described in his novel 1984? Thank you so much. Done. That, that was a great usage of time specifically, as well as the uh, clear card divisions with respect to the three points that is bandwidth problem, excessive decentralization and storage. Thank you so much, Gurpreet, uh, for putting in your thoughts there. And, and again, coming to my question of why in, in one line, I know you gave out a great conclusion there, but in one line again, why do you think people shouldn't be shifting to Web 3.0 from Web 2.0? I believe that we shouldn't shift because the technology is not mature yet. That's the Done. simple answer I'm going to give. Done. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gurpreet, for that uh, conclusion there. And now I'd like to, uh, or, or before opening up the stage for the team, for uh, to uh, rebuttal Gurpreet's arguments there. I'd like to mention uh, to the attendees that have joined this meeting on, on YouTube or Zoom, we are gonna open up the stage in, in another two or three minutes. And before that, uh, you can just pitch in your questions on the live chat box and we're gonna ask the speakers and, and hear their thoughts on the same. So please feel free to ask in your questions on what you think these speakers should answer and uh, we're gonna get that answer there. So now I'd like to move uh, for the team, for team on uh, what do you think could be your rebuttals on uh, Gurpreet's session there? First of all, again, I'd like to mention crypto and Web 3.0 are completely two different things and crypto has specifically been targeted. And considering the cost benefit analysis, we are forgetting what Web 3.0 is bringing on the table. The metaverse, augmented reality, AI, we are all forgetting that. That was one of the things. And as Gurpreet said, that uh, cryptocurrencies do use a lot of energy. But according to a recent Harvard article, Harvard Business Review, I was just searching and it found out Cardano is one of the best and best known green cryptos and the power consumption per transaction is 0 0.05479 kilowatts. That's it. That's even less. I recently quoted it from the Harvard Business Review and 
also, I like to say that sometimes we do need to make changes. And humans are able to survive just because we are the only species that are adaptable to changes. And some later, sooner or the later, we need to, you know, and I know that we need to make that move. And moreover, maturity of the usage comes with experience and not with assumptions that it's just early. Got it. So yes, uh, Manu, uh, what would be a, a specific question? Uh, my first specific question would be yeah. that, do you like getting your data shared with anybody and you like your personal data, even when you're having some chats, like let's say you are having a chat with your friend saying, I want a blue shirt. And the very next second, you have an advertisement on your personalized field that, hey, this is a blue shirt you wish to buy. Do you like that? Like, don't you get scared sometimes that, hey, somebody might be reading your private conversations or even though if it's an AI or very fine-tuned yes. algorithms. Over to you. So, Manu. Yes, thank you, Manu. Over to you, please. Actually, um, you're, you have really talked about many things many 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 things from the why uh, 2.0 is different to 3.0 mm -hmm. and about metaverse and about about the data being shared so uh, let me point uh, you know answer to each and every question definitely like, go ahead and from meta uh, right? mm -hmm. so uh, the thing is that uh, with the metaverse you put on your virtual reality headset right you get transported to this world where everything you do, every intera interaction you are, you have this with this another person, is being tracked and surveilled, right? Not really. Well, it's my opinion, mm -hmm. and, and 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 all of this is happening, right? All of this is happening uh, at the same time when the world outside the metaverse, the physical one, is crumbling due to climate change and the inequality. Because we all just being entertained, numbed, and distracted by this immersive digital world. So I do. I I, I have a very dy dystopian view of metaverse, which many people are not talking about. And I see, in a nutshell, Got the metaverse. It. But please, uh, yeah, like yes. So good, please. Uh, so coming coming to that uh, one specific question there, what do you think with with regards to the energy requirements or or the energy data that Manu mentioned specifically? Right? Yeah, and then then we can move forward with right. uh, the well, other parts. Well, according to many of the uh, well, these these figures are from uh, I've actually fact checked all of these two figures from mm -hmm. Down to magazine and from the New York Times. So uh, uh, I really don't know where you're getting these informa information. I about. recently so, stated Harvard, Harvard Business Review. Uh, yes. uh, I have to check, yes, Manu, uh, to check my sources again. I have to get back. Got it, got it. Awesome. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Gurpreet, with, with regards to that uh, question there. And uh, now we will open up the stage for, for questions by the audience. Um, I just see one question that is specific to Gurpreet again. And uh, Jinaika Paul asks, what are your views on uh, development and in increasing scope of AI in Web 3.0? Uh, well, Over to you, Gurpreet. Well, uh... I'm speaking against Web 3.0, so well, that's a very interesting question. But uh, just being a devil's advocate for a second, um, I do believe um, I do believe in the potential of uh, Web 3.0. It has a lot to offer us on the table, right? There are a lot of things which we can get out of it. Like uh, we wouldn't have imagined, like like in cyber, in many of the uh, countries, like in Turkey. Where the financial situation, there's a lot of inflation, but and where the currency is just decreasing rapidly. But it's only in these situations that many of the people, when they are losing their life savings, they find Bitcoin and all of these digital currencies as a way to invest in. So I I do find I I, I do think that uh, these there are some positive aspects to it as well. 
but uh, still i am a bit uh, skeptical about it and i do think that uh, uh, there are few negatives and there's a general tendency of many people yeah, and i yes. uh, gurpreet uh, gurpreet uh, we are we are running short of time I'm so sorry. again in one line yeah in one line what do you think uh, what are your views on uh, the development and increasing scope of ai in the field of web 3.0 so if you could answer that question uh, we will really just the jump thing forward that, with things the thing is that it's a wait and watch situation and we just can't make any statement right now many of the people including mark uh, in it got it all right are still very skeptical about it so that's that that's it that is all i have to say done done got it perfect yes Yes. So basically, you are following the wait and watch approach, and and want to see on how things will evolve in the future, right? Because and the audience that have uh, joined in to this session today, and uh, before before closing out, I'd I'd like to hear each of your thoughts in in one line again. All right, just one line. What what are your closing arguments? And let's start out with Manav there. it's one of uh, one very simple line i'd like to say be the part of the change or fear the change and choice right. it up to you thank you so much thank you so much manav next moving on to uh, abu bakr uh right i think we are both striving for the same future but it's the skeptic skeptics that actually shape the future and not the you know uh, people that are for it because the people that are for it visionize, visionize it the people that are skeptical about it shape it that's it thank you god see so, yeah. so, it over to you uh, shrinjay yeah. so i believe the change is inevitable but the fact is it is only the we people who are going to address the issues and it is only the we people who are going to make this make the change ahead yeah that's it god thank you so much Sanjay, and now to Gurpreet, what would be your uh, closing remarks? I think that at this point of time, we have to be extra cautious. We are at a very significant point in our history that just as the decisions made ten, fifteen years ago by the people running companies like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, ended up having a huge ripple effect, not just on our technology but on our politics and our culture. I think we are at that moment right now. and we really need to scrutinize each and everything which web 3.0 is offering us god not okay god good treat uh thank you so much for your closing remarks again and uh, this was the debate session for today and i hope the audience did take a, a, a great learning out of it and offering my remarks specifically as as all the speakers mentioned right everybody wants to jump into the next big change or or create that change themselves and we are all on the same page there but the only uh, problem or the only divide on on factors is that how are we going to lead this change to the betterment of people because technology is, is just technology again it's it's not directly uh, related to people as such it's the opinions of people is that matters there there have been a lot of technologies that have come out in the past but only when people value that and people get the best out of that technology is when that impact can be felt so how are we going to impact people in the best possible way is something that we need to think about so so by by telling that i would like to uh, close this debate for today and thank you so much all the speakers for your wonderful remarks and the session that you gave out and thank you so much audience for listening to all of their remarks and being such a wonderful audience out there and and over to you akil uh, the stage is all yours to take it forward thank you sir uh, that was indeed very delightful and very nice session that you have conducted here we would like to thank you for uh, joining the session i would like to thank agrim sir as well 
uh, I would like to request the participants to please fill out the two forms that have been shared. Filling out the two forms will uh, ensure that we give you the certificate for the workshop. So also please vote for the team uh, which you uh, like the most and which you felt uh, had a better argument at the debate. And I would uh, really like to thank everyone again uh, and the special mention to Agrim sir and uh, Amog sir and to the four participants who were selected for the finale. We will finalize the results and we will announce it tomorrow in our socials. And uh, please stay tuned to Cosmos uh, IITM uh, on Instagram. And we will send out mails to the uh, winners as well as the runner-up team. So, and uh, all the four participants will be getting uh, t-shirts, uh, official uh, covalent merch uh, on uh, after the communication happens. So, yeah. Uh, that is it for this event and we would like to wind up and thank you for, uh, thank you for the participants for joining and supporting us over here. And yes, thank you everyone. Have a great evening. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Akri. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye, all of you. Bye. Bye.